Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, my name is Ahmed Umara, and on behalf of LuxFlag, I'm extremely happy to start the new session um, uh, of the LuxFlag Sustainable Investment Week. Um, I am pleased to introduce the session on the potential of ESG data in private markets hosted by Intertrust Luxembourg. Intertrust is uh, dedicated uh, to provide world-leading specialized administration services in over 30 jurisdictions and has developed a deep expertise in ESG data collection, analysis uh, of ESG performance and the uh, implementation of ESG uh, practices. I'm really looking forward to hearing how private market funds uh, are capturing, monitoring, and reporting ESG data, and how this approach uh, compares to between the private market funds and usage firms. For that, I'm pleased to have with us today Antonello Argenziano, who is Director of Product Development and Tita Trust Group. Please, Antonello. <laughs> uh, Antonello has more than 15 years in financial services, leading new product development at Intertrust Group globally, and uh, with uh, an increasing focus on the ESG aspects over the past three years. Antonello. <laughs> Good afternoon. We have with us also Jane Wilkinson. <laughs> been there, been around from day one experienced independent director sitting on the boards of many AIFs and UCITS funds. Um, prior to being an independent director, Jane was head of sustainable finance at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. She was also the only Luxembourg appointed member of the European Commission's Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance. Last but not least, Frédéric Bonner. <laughs> Advisory partner at PwC. Frederic is the sustainability and ESG lead at PricewaterhouseCoopers, managing projects and advising for more than 70 years, asset, 17 years asset managers and, <laughs> and security services provider. So um, maybe to start with just a number of facts um, uh, before actually starting the, the panel, uh, I would refer to the survey um, that was done by uh, Intertrust, uh, which has actually one key takeaway, which is that in the decade ahead, 55% of investors or LPs will be looking for live or daily updates on ESG, which is actually 10 percentage points higher than anticipated by CFOs that have been surveyed. So, first question maybe to, to, to break the ice if you want. When it comes to ESG data, what are the biggest challenges private market fund managers face when capturing, monitoring, and reporting ESG data? Antonello, can you, can you comment on this, please? Sure, thanks. So, here's a microphone. So uh, our survey, it's uh, an yearly survey we conducted together with Global Custodian uh, this year, I think we interviewed about 250 uh, CFOs from uh, private capital firms. Uh, I'd say that really the key uh, takeaway is that uh, quality of data, according to the responders, has already increased significantly compared to the previous year. Also, the cadence, the frequency uh, on which the data is provided has increased. However, challenges remain. So. When looking at challenges, cost is clearly one. Inavailability of data is a key challenge, and also shortage of talents of resources, uh, according to the responders, is uh, clearly uh, a challenge in the market. Frederic, do you see that any differently? Not really. Um, I, th I think, um, and you might have heard it already in the past, uh, when it comes to assessment finance, um, we're talking about data, 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 data. Uh, whether it's about the quality of data, whether it's about, uh, as, as you say, the availability of data. W one thing I, th 
I, I believe we, we have to acknowledge and to keep in mind is that, um, and looking at the clients we're working in, or uh, we're mm -hmm. working with already uh, in, the, in this space, uh, there's a shift in the, um, in the range and type of data that's required. Um, we see uh, private market players who used to be in, uh, uh, working with a system finance and ESG uh, metrics or matrices, uh, integrating certain level of ESG in, their, uh, in, in the management of their, of their assets. And these might have been different looking at the type of assets and asset strategies that we're looking at. Uh, real estate, for example, has been looking into, our reset managers have been looking into uh, ESG matters since a long time already. Um, yet the point to me is that how things have been looked at historically and what we, is required now from also from a regulatory standpoint, if we think about SFDR, if we think about APAI, if we think about a, the definition of what is a sustainable investment, whether it's about a taxonomy of, or SFDR, uh, the range, the scope, the type of data is changing. And um, this is a shift that uh, asset managers, especially in the private market space, have to acknowledge, to understand, because even the processes might be there to collect data from investments, from investing companies, from the assets, the type of data, the, um, the granularity, the frequency of the, of the update of data is, is changing and is increasing, thus making it more complex for those players to, uh, to tackle those, those changes. Especially in the private market, I may add. Especially, especially in the private market area in grid, where basically you cannot buy data from the ESG vendor, or very difficultly. No, and, and indeed to that point, um, um, Jane, how does the approach um, to ESG data um, collection, um, monitoring and reporting compare between the private market firms and the more usage or maybe liquid, if you want, uh, investment type? And, and to what extent have private market firms learned from or maybe even followed uh, the lead, if we can say that there's a lead coming from the usage side of the business? Well, I think the, uh, the need for data, the, the processes that you need to implement to collect all this data um, is very similar so the challenge is very similar but the solutions and the systems and the processes that need to be implemented are very different um in use it's at least from my observations um they're they're buying like what fred just said huh? they're, they're buying they're buying data in general some of them maybe the more the larger asset managers um that maybe have more general, uh, general uh, Article 8 type promotional funds, not, not necessarily thematic. Um, those asset managers are um, maybe some of them, the bigger ones that are improving upon the data that they buy. So I think many of the asset, the, the bigger uses managers, they're buying, um, they've got numerous different sustainability data sources, and then they have the layer on top of their own teams that are uh, working on um, maybe interpreting that data, um, applying their own scoring systems. Um, that's kind of, I would say, what's happening in the usage world. In the private markets world, I mean, the, the, the data points, I mean, the principal adverse impacts, we've got, we've got standards, standard uh, data points that need to be collected. But I think in the private markets world, um, it's maybe a little bit more of a, a bespoke approach and I think it's a probably um, a little bit more difficult to industrialize because if I look at some of my private equity clients they are not um, that they're not necessarily focused on one particular sector you know they're not saying we're going to invest in climate solutions some, some of course very specialists want to do but the, the general PE house they may be looking at healthcare and technology and um, uh, buildings or something. And, and, and so you have this mixture of kind of focus areas. So by the nature, the material uh, ESG elements for healthcare industry are different, different from uh, technology. So it, it, it adds a kind of different layer of 
bespokeness and, and specialization that, that, that they need to look at, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Fred, do you see that as well, be, the, the bespoke sort of dimension and maybe the materiality or relevance that, that Jane has mentioned? Yeah, very true. Um, I don't want to, uh, to engage again on another regulatory explanations uh, here today. I think you, you might have heard already in, in previous sessions all about uh, SFDR, taxonomy, PAI, as, as you mentioned, Jane. Um, yet, I think that I, if we look at the variety of ways that ESG can be defined by the various uh, private market players, whether we're looking at real estate, whether we're looking at private equity, whether we're even looking at the debt or infrastructure manager. The variety of ways that ESG and some finance investments or some investments sorry, can be defined creates also a variety of approaches for, to, to, to data. And um, it is sometimes sorry, complica complicated within the same private market asset manager to define one unique way of understanding things and understanding what diversity means, for example. Um, if we expand that across the various players, across the various uh, private market asset managers, we create as many definitions of what is adversity than we have players, at least. Um, some might say, uh, I, I, I want to promote diversity in my fund, and diversity would be measured by the number of uh, female executives at the, the management of the company. Some others will say, um, and that's what we've heard yesterday from Union, for example, we're looking at the top three layers of management of the company, and we take uh, data amongst the three layers. So for the same information, we already have two different definitions just by listening to two different players. And um, to, to, your to your point, sorry, on the bespoke uh, specificity and, and the bespoke characteristics of the data, um, I was about to say that's the beauty of the thing at the end of the day. Um, that's the beauty of the thing because we will have as many different ways of describing diversity, as describing uh, CO2 emission reduction, as describing social impact, that we might have investment products. So that at the end of the day, each and every investor might find something that is tailored and adapted to, uh, to their needs, which obviously creates complexity also, uh, because comparability of, uh, of investment funds, investment returns, investment strategy is complicated. Um, the more we tailor, uh, the more it requires asset manager to explain also what they do, to disclose what they do, to report on what they do, and that expose also those players to potential claims, I potential complaints from, from their investors um, because of a misunderstanding on uh, whatever definition might be put forward, um, because of uh, missing the target or defined target on a very specific criteria because at the end of the day, data is simply not there. So yes, it is a very um, interesting domain. Um, but again, I think the complexity comes to, from the fact that for the time being, at least, uh, we don't have a unified approach, um, which is also the beauty of the thing. And, and I mean, the, the reality of the challenge of some of, some, some of these organizations in private markets, I, I cite an example of um, an infrastructure, infrastructure fund manager I sit on the board. Their head of sustainability has had investor questions so that now, of course, their, uh, their investors are institutional investors, so their pension funds, their insurance companies. So they're all looking at, oh my God, how, do we, how are we as investors gonna report our um, our impacts, our principal adverse impacts, how our investment portfolios are performing. And, and they are getting, and of course they have, they have investors in the US and they have investors in the Middle East, they have Asian investors, they have European investors. And depending on the jurisdiction of where their investors come, they're getting completely different questions because the US, uh, they're really hot on, on diversity, um, Black Lives Matter, gender, uh, LGBTQ, and, and whereas in, in, in Europe, um, uh, people are, I think, a little bit less, uh, that's not the number one issue, diversity today, it may be in, in a year or two, but so, the, so they're f having to field so many different um, questions and requests for data and 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 
it's quite tricky for a, a, um, a, a private markets player to kind of manage their investor expectations in this kind of world of, of movement. I mean, and we need to see, uh, I think we do still need to see a bit of standardization uh, to, to, to help the private market players to actually get a bit of control and, and push back maybe a little bit to their investors and say, actually, for the moment, we're not collecting that data. That's not in our, our key material areas for us. But, um, and we know that there are some already initiatives on the market on standardization. So there's a ILPA data convergence project. I know that, for example, as well, uh, GRI are discussing with SASB trying to find uh, common standards. But those are still competing principles, so still competing standards. And uh, it feels that the industry is still far away from the standardization. I actually question whether there will never be a standardization in that respect. And if, 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 if I may, and I, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I might go off track compared to what we agreed we're going to say. That's why I don't have the notes with me. So next time, I'm not invited to the panel. I, I understand this. I apologize for that. Um, I think at the same time, we should not forget, to me, what is the purpose of collecting that kind of data? Um, because it's nice to discuss about, and it's very important points, all what, we did, uh, all what you said. Um, systems, which I believe is a very interesting point also to, to, to engage into. Um, but the purpose of working out um, that sustain, sustainability data or data sets for, for an asset manager, especially in the private market space, is, in my view at least, to create value down the road. So that the assets and the investing company um, are better evaluated when it comes to have those assets being sold. So all those points, all what we're discussing about data, all what you might have heard about data already in the past, to me should be put in the context of the overall investment strategy, especially in the private market space, yeah, but which is, is about really value creation. This is where really technology helps you, right? If you're able to demonstrate with KPIs, with dashboards, that you have invested in a company, you have worked with that company through active engagement and created that plan, reduced the mission, improved uh, KPIs like general equality and all the rest, then you can actually say, I have a company which is future proof. And fully agree with you, yet, I st I'm sorry to challenge you internally on that one. Um, to me, we should not I get wrong with the priority. To me, the priority is not the tools and the systems is what do we want as an asset manager to invest in and how do we want to create value for the investors into the fund and down the road for the society overall. It's very important to have all the tools to be able to demonstrate engagements, mm -hmm. all, what we, uh, all what you mentioned, but the primary objective from a strategy standpoint should be value, crea value creation and data is just there to support that value creation. And, and to that point, in <laughs> that, not agree, doesn't agree no, no, with me. I, I get your point. I get your point, and we were discussing it as well, right? Uh, we have we have seen those waves of uh, data management challenges with KID, with Prips, and sometimes you have the feeling really that uh, all the industry is going in the right direction, trying to make all this effort about creating documents that, at the end of the day, investors may not even read. So, but but then. If we look at data and everything you've mentioned between data and value creation and the link that the managers actually make between those two, um, in terms of role um, of a data vendor compared to the past, and also if we want to bring the, um, the bespokeness, if you want, and the, and, and the fact that data there is extremely, extremely customized, is it giving somehow a new role maybe or a different role to data vendors in the private market space compared to what we see a bit more traditionally uh, in, the, in the liquid or usage uh, space? Shall uh, I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I go for it, Anto, and then... Uh... Uh, you, you mentioned it before, right? Uh, in uh, the liquid market, people buy data. In the private market, we know that the dynamics are completely different in the sense that uh, you will not find on uh, Sustainalytics or uh, on MSCI data from a small or medium company. So this is where you have to get it from the source. 
I think that creates an opportunity because when you get data from the source, you also create that mechanism where you will have that interaction and discussion that facilitates, I think, the active engagement that at the end of the day is really what the regulation is looking after or one of, I think, the implied objectives of the regulation. Agreed, and, um, and this is where I will make the split, a, clear, a more clear split between private markets on one side and liquid assets on the other side. I think, uh, Antonio, you've been you know, to the point when it comes to the uh, private market area. The, the asset managers uh, and all the governance bodies around that getting access to the source to the right level of data. And, and Jane, I would be, I love to hear your point as a board member also, as to how a board member should look into those processes or not, I don't know. Um, yet, if we make a quick comparison with the liquid space, uh, usage and uh, listed securities and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think in the past, asset managers and asset services have been relying on ESG data vendors, considering this as an outsourcing, uh, buying data without really taking care or considering whether it was the right set of data, whether how, how the data was computed, because the, there was market standards which were there. A closing price is a closing price. A, an interest rate of a bond is an interest rate of the bond. There's no many ways to consider uh, an interest rate, interest, rate, interest rate differently. With the ESG's data, everything uh, changed. Everything is changed. I, I, I remember having checked, uh, and I will not give the name, having checked the quality of data that uh, a major uh, ESG data, the data vendor was providing. And uh, I've just mentioned two data sets for a very large quoted European-based company. One data set or data point was about um, the number of, uh, the percentage, sorry, of female at the board level. Results, 50%. The next data point was number of person at the board level, one. <laughs> and there was no check on that. I mean, people are is, is buying the data without necessarily thinking, is the data that I'm buying right or wrong? What are the checks that I do, the, the very basic coherence check? So that outsourcing of uh, getting access to information that used to work and is still working, the liquid space for well-known data points, is not working the same in the liquid space for ESG data. And it's even worse, if I may say so, for the uh, uh, private market area because that data and the access to the data is, is not there. Yet, I still believe that there is an opportunity for the AG vendors to enter this space and to, to build and uh, to use their technology, their skills, their competencies to act as a brokerage company to a certain extent between certain uh, uh, target assets and the, uh, the asset manager. But that's maybe another discussion. But um, what you've just described is precisely my, about the public markets, it's precisely my problem sitting on the board. Um, but we need to be, well, I need to be to a certain extent pragmatic today. Um, everybody's focused on regulatory compliance. Um, we are in a jurisdiction where regulatory compliance is really right up there as one of the most important things also when you're sitting on the board however the 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 next question that comes is have have you uh, manco or whoever done your due diligence done a proper due diligence on msci sustainalytics whoever it is on the quality of the data and i i, I think that will be the next I guess the next pressure that's going to come from the asset managers on the data providers now now do a better job because we're you we're using this we're using it for decision making we're using this for reporting um, and our investors are going to use this to decide whether they're going to give us more capital uh, next year and the year after so that it, it does genuinely become a, a challenge now if I just sit on a, an, an eighth board um, in, a, in a different perspective, there I at least have, um, to a certain extent, either contractually or as an uh, indirect access as, an equ as a shareholder, I do have more control on... You own on, the process there, or... I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm more the owner through 
the partners of the PE firm who are sitting on the boards of the target companies, the portfolio companies. I, I should be able to get my fingers more into the portfolio companies in, in theory and in practice. But, but again, it, it, it's, it's still a similar challenge because the portfolio companies, I think what PE houses are doing now or, or, or the alternative asset managers, are, they are actually having to sit much more closely with their portfolio company teams to help either to assist them, to help them, to train them, to ensure that they have expertise internally to be able to collect this data so that it is reliable. So it, 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 it's, it, the ESG teams in, in alternative asset managers are actually turning into um, portfolio company, more portfolio company advisors um, than they maybe had as, as a role before, um, which makes it actually more interesting for those people as well, because they're working more closely with portfolio companies. And going back to the discussion, Fred, before, that encourages value creation, right? Yeah, Having it that. does. Yeah. No, it does. Yeah. And, and actually, maybe to, to go even further uh, on, that, on that aspect that you have uh, mentioned, uh, Jane, you've discussed about data availability and data quality and the role that board of directors and if you, if you allow me the, the grip that they have over uh, vendors and to the extent to which managers can control what they're receiving from those vendors do you see any other difference or any other opportunity for private market firms that they can do dif differently or maybe even better than uh, their, their usage sort of or, or, or liquid equivalent. Any other aspects rather than just data quality and, and, the, and the control they have over it? If, if, if I may help you on that one, Jane. <laughs> um, again, I think to me is, um, I, 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 will, I, I think it would be wrong to just look at data collection, data quality, data check, the dissemination, blah, blah, blah. Um, to me, the key point is how the asset manager and the various uh, teams in the asset management uh, company is looking at um, making sure that the data that they get helps them, helps them making better decisions. Um, better decisions whether it's about investing or divesting, uh, or better decisions in the management of the company. Um, we, we talk a lot about transition, we talk a lot about uh, a ramping up period when we talk about AIFs. Um, but when, when an AIF, when a PE company is invest or a PE fund is investing into a target company, the point there is to make sure that down the road the company will be better, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from an ESG standpoint more and more. And um, I believe that whatever alternative player, private market player for the time being, uh, will not be considering this kind of ESG improvement of our time, will be proven wrong. Um, again, I think we already have, especially in Luxembourg, a number of real estate players that have been integrating uh, ESG data in, you, know, you name it, uh, whether it's about uh, having buildings uh, and commercial centers covered with uh, solar panels to improve the, uh, uh, the usage of uh, renewable energies or, or uh, engines and, and, and devices, that's the name I was looking for, devices to measure uh, uh, CO2 emission or the, the lights being sw properly switched off at night. Um, this is how basically the asset manager in the private market space is creating value again, back to my value creation point. I think the data uh, here is just there to make sure that at the end there is an increase in the value of the asset when the asset is being sold. Um, and also, let's not forget what we're talking about. This is also about driving the sustainability agenda. So it's also about uh, it, the development of society. I know you're skeptical on that, right? I'm that not. This has really an impact, but I think it's also a fundamental part. The, the principle of uh, regulation, there's a lot of Article 9. All of Article 9 funds are impact funds. They do it because they want to have a positive impact on society. It's not just about returns. Uh -uh. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
well, we can discuss this at, at the drinks afterwards. Um, I'll be interested in knowing Jane what she thinks. I <laughs> and and I, I still believe that for the time being, most of, the, at least the discussions we're having with our clients, I, on my side, most of the discussion we have about value creation is about financial value creation. I'm not saying that there is no P houses or, or, or plain market houses out there that are not looking at having an impact. But if you look at the, um, the number of impact funds that we have in the private market space, the real impact funds, the real ones having an impact um, and not pretending to promote something, that which is, is which is which is already good because it's it, it's a start it's of a good the train, train right? as, as Darius mentioned yesterday. It's the start of the train, and we have to take that train so that train leaves the station and and, and goes to to full speed. Um, but let's be honest. For the time being, I doubt that um, Luxmog funds and don't quote me on that will be the ones saving the world. I think um, we might have a lot of impact. Nine funds uh, having proper impact. Yes. But the vast majority of the funds that we see for the time being are the ones that are integrating certain level of ESG matters dimension into a more broader approach in parallel to the financial contribution. So that's engagement. That's, exactly. That's exactly, exactly, exactly what you mean, right? But, but I do think, I mean, th this is a necessary step we need to go through. Um, hopefully it will be a very short-lived step um, that everybody gets gets it uh, starts feeling a little bit of urgency I mean we have achieved this attention to ESG I'm quite convinced because we now have regulation and that's why we're all talking about it if there was no regulation we would still not be talking about it uh, despite the fact that that it's I don't know well it was due to be 23 degrees today I'm not quite sure it is but but um, uh, the point is that, well, I can't remember what my point was anymore. <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah, we, exactly. We, we, we're on this journey. Uh, we all, in sustainability, we always, always talk about journeys. I hope that we are moving towards measuring the impact and, and investors will be looking at the impact. It's like transition. Um, we had, there were some discussions yesterday on transition. Um, if you are investing in the transition, then your impact will be far greater because you're going from down there right up to there. There, there are decisions that need to be made, but impact somehow, we have to start measuring what are the impacts and what are the outcomes of what we're doing. And I think that, that the next step, I mean, there are some asset managers, the mainstream ones, who have been doing ESG for years. They suddenly now have um, everybody, all of their peers, they're all doing ESG. How do they differentiate themselves? Well, they're going to have to start leading the way uh, on impact and, and being able to demonstrate and prove that capital is flowing to the right place, and this is the impact that we're achieving. So I think we're on a, it's a step. Um, the thing is, we actually really need to go a little bit faster than probably what's going to happen and, in reality. And, and don't take me wrong, I'm sitting here yeah. today because I truly believe that we all have a role to play. Uh, I'm, I'm not so cynical that I'm sitting here today just because I love regulations. Um, no, I, Although I, you do. I, I do also. <laughs> uh, um, but I'm an Article 8 for this one. You know, I'm doing <laughs> regulations on the top than the, uh, yeah. than, than the rest. Um, no, but I, I, I truly believe to, to what you're saying, uh, John, is that uh, Jane, sorry, not John. Uh, Jane, we have to start somewhere. Yeah. And. Uh, um, Someone has to start. Uh, I, I was yesterday having a discussion with uh, um, private bankers. Say, you know, uh, EU, we're making a lot of regulations, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, what about the US? Uh, what about the Asian investors? What about the Asian asset managers and so on? Yes, but there must be a start somewhere. And I'm yeah. proud, still proud, to be part of that block yeah. that is starting to do something. And to that extent, I mean, We've mentioned from a regulatory perspective that indeed EU is leading the way uh, globally uh, in terms of sustainable finance. But how different is actually the approach of the other regulators and what are the drivers behind in your opinion? Sure. Well, first of all, let's say that uh, uh, we know that a vast part of uh, 
large economies have subscribed to uh, the commitment to net zero carbon, right? We've also heard it in the previous panel. Uh, so that means that uh, there has to be an agenda where uh, there, there is a push towards sustainable finance uh, that has to permeate into regulation. Now the approach can be different. So we know, for example, in the US, uh, SEC is also working on a new set of rules uh, uh, to, uh, to impose, in a way, disclosure uh, on uh, adverse impact, uh, sustainability risk, uh, and, uh, and uh, carbon emissions. But probably their approach is a little bit more uh, rule-based rather than, uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, principle-based, I'd say, which in a way probably is uh, not a bad thing. That's my opinion. What do you think, Fred? Why me? Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, there have been always those two differences between the US bloc uh, on one side and the EU bloc on one side, rules versus principles. Um, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. Um, it's just a way that to look at regulations, to way to look at you know, the, the, uh, the society also being operated uh, overall that is, I think, different between the two, uh, the two blocks. Um, Yet, and I will not elaborate on the SEC rules, uh, but happy to do so uh, later on if you wish. Um, what, I, what I think is important to notice is that worldwide, each and every economic bloc or individual countries almost um, is engaged into that transition, is engaged into doing something so that tomorrow's world will be better functioning. Um, Yet we, we have to, to acknowledge the fact also that uh, each and every block, each and every country has its own uh, objectives, uh, its own shorter term agenda, its own specificities also. Uh, uh, look at the EU taxonomy uh, on nuclear and gas energy production. I will not to make the whole story here because it will be sitting here <laughs> the entire night, but uh, um, within an, a, an economic block that is more or less coherent, we still have major differences. Uh, there are discussions ongoing between EU on one side and China on the other side when it comes to taxonomy. Yet the way that the railway transportation industry is seen in the two blocks is different. So China might be less interested into having a railway transportation included into their own taxonomy because they're less in, it's, it's less of their issue or less of the, one of the solutions that they believe is, 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 is important. So I think we have to acknowledge those differences also when looking at how the different blocks the different regulatory players are, are, are looking at the, at the topic. But again, I think the most important thing is that we're all making move towards a better functioning world. Um, not only, and I was looking at the people in the room, l trying to guess the average age. Um, I guess, I'm sorry for most of you, you might not enjoy what we all be, what we are all discussing now, uh, but it's for the next generations also. Well, and, and I think it's a very fair, uh, obviously, uh, comment. And, and just being conscious of time, uh, I'd maybe ask a, a closing question, um, which is indeed probably back to the <coughs> private market specificity and what, in your opinion, will bridge the gap between aspirations around the ESG and the, and the current reality? Uh, that the private market firms uh, or fund firms uh, are currently facing? Antonello. Antonello. So clearly uh, the data challenge is, uh, is a big one. Uh, there is also, uh, of course, in, uh, in our industry, uh, we have now a framework in Europe where with uh, some differences of interpretation, we know, or hopefully we will know soon what constitutes a sustainable asset. But if we look outside of Europe, if we look at the manager investing outside of Europe, and uh, also to your point before, uh, this may vary, very, uh, the, the, the criteria may be very different. The sensitivity may be very different. Uh, I'm working with uh, uh, clients that invest, for example, in the South of Europe, sensitivity to our ESG and definitions are very different from clients working in the Nordics. So I think this is uh, certainly going to be a challenge ahead. 
uh, but uh, I think as long as uh, we have that positive uh, uh, trend uh, toward uh, progress and hopefully uh, despite uh, the uh, current uh, geo geopolitical environment, we still keep our commitment to the targets uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, on one side, of course, uh, net zero commitments, but also on the SDGs. I think uh, we are probably in, uh, in the right direction, so I'm optimistic for the future. Thank you, Antonello. So global convergence is probably then the... the the, the, the element that will actually uh, bridge that gap. Um, I would like to thank you all uh, panelists uh, for uh, your time uh, today. Um, we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions from the audience or maybe online. I can't really see, unfortunately, because of the, of the light. For the Lux Flag team, for the next conference, if we do it in room, it would be good to have a you know, cap. <laughs> or sunglasses. A Lux Flag cap. <laughs> sunglasses can work. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas van der Hayden um, from, from Brink. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of um, the fact that in the private markets, usually the investment time horizons are are longer than they are in public markets. And there's also the lack of the glare of quarterly earnings calls. Um, how does that sort of factor into this whole value creation versus, you know, sustainability being pushed through these portfolio companies over a longer term time horizon? How does that factor in with um, the discussion you were having? Shall I go for it? You'll, do, you'll, no, no, go, you'll, go, go. you'll complete, I'm sure. <laughs> So I think, first of all, uh, the, uh, what we see in the private market is that uh, it's very important to define beforehand an ESG policy, uh, a framework also for the selection of assets. Because once that framework is created, once you have invested, then it's very difficult to adjust the, co the composition of your portfolio. It's not like in the public market. In the public market, uh, there is a regulatory change, Maybe the interpretation of SSDR changes. So, okay, you need to adjust some criteria, some threshold. You can easily do it by divesting and investing in something new. Private market, the dynamics are different. You have to foresee possible changes. Uh, so this is probably also one of the reasons why, not to speak too much about regulation, but we see that in the private sector, there's a certain reluctance in... Uh, applying uh, uh, or registering as Article 9 uh, because the regulation is still unclear. So nobody really wants to take the risk that maybe at the moment uh, there are no clear threshold on uh, uh, how many sustainable assets have to be in the portfolio, then that threshold is created and I will be forced perhaps to downgrade my fund. So on one side, you have to have a clear definition of uh, the impact that you want to achieve the uh, framework that you want to create, but also you have to bear in mind that there's still a lot of moving parts on the market. I, I might just complain with a, a, a complementary view on that. Um, if we look at how our private market players have been managing assets in the past, I don't believe that that ESG topic is brand new to them, in the sense that um, Historically, private market players have been looking at creating value. And I, I think it's the fourth time that I repeat it. I'm sorry for repeating myself for sounding like a broken record on that one. But private market players have been looking at creating value from a financial standpoint. Between the moment they were investing into an asset till the, 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 their plan, basically, to, to divestment. Now what we're saying is, besides the financial perspective, we just and I'm not saying it's easy, but we're just adding an extra layer, which is about sustainability in the ESG. So we add a certain level of data sets whereby the usual processes of investment of a private market player, which is to create value over time, is to be expanded beyond just the pure, the pure financial perspective. Um, the players that we're looking at, uh, that we're working at, for, sorry, for the time being, um, some of them 
have integrated this already years ago. They, are, they were historically very well engaged on sustainability and ESG matters. For the most, for, for the ones having the most recent approach to that matters, we still see that it's not th this ESG creation or value creation is not something that is completely alien to them. As soon as they understand that, basically, it's the same business that they were used to do in terms of financial performance increase applied to ESG standards and ESG data. So I, I guess that's the main shift that m private market players had to face or will have to face, which is adding that layer of ESG materiality, ESG considerations into their investment processes, not only looking at financial uh, uh, value creation. And uh, I, I have to say I have a very similar experience. A client that uh, has been investing in the business for a, a, pri a private equity client, uh, investing in uh, schools, in education, uh, and uh, uh, depending on the various portfolio, really making an impact. They didn't want to know anything about TSG because they thought they were afraid of uh, the regulatory implications of ESG. But then while discussing with the client, they realized actually this is our bread and butter. So I think it's also that uh, understanding that this is not something extremely different from the core business, fully agree. Thank you. And, and maybe we can, maybe if I can add one, my you know, two penny uh, example. It's also in particular true for the infrastructure world where it's been around for years, uh, ESG and climate and environment considerations. But um, I'll, I'll be looking at the audience once more to check if there is, if there is additional questions. Hi, Alex Veres, Intercontinental Exchange. Um, <laughs> common word you've all been saying and which is possibly key in ESG is the word data. And when it comes to data providers, they're moving a lot into um, ESG ratings. Now in 2008, um, 2009, where we saw the global financial crisis, a lot of the rating agencies, not so much on the ESG, but on sovereign rating, the Moody's, the S&P, came under a lot of scrutiny mm. about their ratings. What's your opinion on regulation and ratings on ESG data? The, the, I mean, well, the credit rating agencies have now cottoned on to the opportunity to, um, they are already to a certain extent thinking about ESG, maybe not directly in their credit ratings per se, but they're also buying up all this expertise. Before we had these, um, um, all the data providers and the agencies, S&P for example, we had all these boutique um, ESG providers. Um, they're no longer boutiques anymore. They've all been bought by MSCI, S&P, Moody's, uh, Fitch. They've all now got their own specialist teams who are doing this. So that's one element. Um, the second element is that from an ESG rating regulation perspective, um, the, EU ha the EU has this on their radar. And, um, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the status is. Maybe, Fred, you know better what the status is on this. But um, those ESG specialized rating agencies with their specialized methodologies, they're not going to get away uh, from the regulation and, and, and future regulation. So I think we will see changes on that as well. And, and then, therefore, um, improvement in quality. But they have different methodologies, provided they're clear on clear on their methodology and it's transparent then it's also okay to come up with different <laughs> different ratings i mean then you can start another i'll have another whole discussion on uh, uh why why tesla has got a fantastic score on one one esg rating and a terrible score on another but but um yeah maybe uh, it's probably time for us to stop <laughs> yeah another day <laughs> I, th I think, and again, this is my, this is my cynical moment. Um, um, <laughs> and I've seen, you know, big signs, shut up. Uh, <laughs> so that, that, uh, <laughs> that's my, uh, uh, so I say that's my cynical moment. I think if regulations only, and I insist on the only, I, I, 
is will allow us to avoid a crisis, we will know it. So whatever regulations will be put out there in terms of ESG rating, ESG uh, uh, um, evaluation assessments, you name it, uh, yes, it's nice and it's fine to have a set framework to navigate through it, yet um, it will not avoid any big crisis, any big issue, if there must be one, uh, whether it's a crisis or an issue. Thank you very this much. my last word. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank again um, today's panelists uh, for uh, this enriching uh, debate. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you again uh, also all the attendees, uh, physically and uh, online. Um, and on to the next uh, session of the LSIW, starting at 4. Thank you very much.